Massage, sex and intimacy aren't necessarily the first three things you'd think of when someone says the phrase old age. But after much media interest in an 80-something-year-old's blog, Grandma Williams is challenging perception of what the later years are really like. Something, in her opinion, which we should be looking forward to. And our age, no matter the number of candles, is something we should be proud of. Young does not equal better. Old does not equate to bad. Today, Grandma Williams shares her wisdom on the reality of being old on our final episode of the Discover Bright Life podcast. As the doors close on Bright Life Cheshire's five-year project, it's time for us to use these final episodes to reflect on what we've learnt, a look back on some of the people we've met along the way, and continue to challenge the myths many of us inherit about the negative stereotypes surrounding life after 50. If you're new to the podcast, then here's an idea of what Bright Life Cheshire has been doing over the last few years. Sat alongside Age UK Cheshire, it's one of 14 national lottery funded ageing better programmes set up across the UK by the Big Lottery Fund to help combat social isolation and loneliness. In previous episodes, we've met social prescribers, the people working on the project. We've also met doctors, the people diagnosing loneliness and referring project participants. And we've also met some of the people who were lonely and isolated and are now actively engaging in their community. We've also met the people who've used the funding to set up their own activities and groups and are already flying the nest and continuing their projects on their own to continue the programme's legacy for many years to come. We've sampled fish and chip dinners at community centres. We've sat in living rooms over cups of tea. And we've told our stories in the dark corners of empty churches. It's been a whirlwind of a project, which has touched everyone's hearts who's engaged at all levels. So we wanted our final episode to be one of strength and positivity, an uplifting way to close the chapter of this story. And that's when we met Joyce at this year's Bright Life Legacy Conference. We knew then that a conversation with her would be a fitting end to support our message on how to overcome loneliness. Because sometimes the best medicine is a good laugh in friendly company. Now, our next guest is on a mission to dispel stereotypes about women and men of a certain age, because according to 83-year-old blogger Joyce Williams, sex toys are great for older people and we should all be indulging in sex into our later years. Well, Joyce's opinions have given her quite a following on social media and we're very pleased to say that she joins us now. Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to see you. And eight one all medium wave. BBC Radio Scotland. She has been described as the oldest blogger in town. Uh, Joyce Williams is 83 and in the year since she started blogging has made quite an impact. Uh, She covers a range of subjects but her underlying message is getting old is great. Uh, Good morning to you, Joyce. Good morning, Kay. Good morning. Meet Joyce, Uh, 83, superstar sex blogger on a mission to dispel the myth that it's only for youngsters, said the Daily Mail headline. On the BBC website, Joyce self-authored a piece titled Seven Reasons Why Old Age Is Actually Awesome. Meet the 83-year-old Gran who blogs about sex in old age and says OAPs love sex toys, read The Sun. But it's not all about sex. That's just the sensational headlines for Joyce's real message here. She's decided to take it upon herself to challenge the horrible negative image of old age. She calls it distressing and demeaning. A mom of one, grandma to two and now blogger, Joyce believes that as a result of this unbalanced view of old age, people are developing an unnecessary fear of it. And that's why she was invited to talk at the Bright Life conference. 
For her, it's the unthinking ageism, which most of us are playing a part in without realising. Something even this morning TV presenter, Philip Schofield, fell foul of whilst Joyce was sat on his sofa live on TV. Yeah. Do you consider yourself to be very lucky? Because um, as you get older, people age in different ways. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, you are uh, you know, certainly young at heart, young at look. Now, you know, I'm going to stop you there. Why are you saying young at heart? Well, because you well, are... You I'm are, old at heart. The point that I'm making is No, that... the point I'm making is to say young at heart is an ageist statement. OK, well, I take it back. <laughs> um, so you're old. Um, so... <laughs> I'm old and I'm happy to be... I'm Good. proud to be old. The point, the point that I'm... So what can we learn from Joyce's wise words? How can we start to change our perception of what lies ahead as we approach our later years? Let's meet the lady herself, 84 years old, a former psychotherapist, married three times, most recently at 74. She's overcome bereavement, becoming a widow, divorce, relocation, and so much more. Joyce is full of stories to share and revel in when looking back at the big picture of her life. So here we are, I'm in Manchester, Joyce in Glasgow, and we've connected via the Zoom video conference app in between her online bridge classes. I was a physiotherapist, and one of the things I did was, of course, work with a lot of old people. And I saw, at that time, only the frail old people that were coming into hospital because they were in trouble. And so I developed my own mental picture of old age, and I didn't have much in the way of grandparents to, to get a model from either. So the model of old age I had in my head was about decline and about the difficulties and problems. And it was only later... Now I've got old. And I thought, hang on a minute, it's not like that at all. And I thought, I just don't know. I didn't know what old age was like. And it's been really quite a pleasant surprise. <laughs> um, I, I really have been delighted to discover what a nice period of life it is. Um, and when I got talking to a whole lot of other people over 70 or whatever, they're all saying the same thing. You know, we're enjoying being 70. It's a very nice period of life. And the kind of things that they're saying is, if you're free, you know, you've got past all this ambition stage, you've got past all, you've coped with things, you know you can cope with things, but you know who you are and you've stopped worrying about who you are. You're living with who you are. You, you know, if you're getting wrinkly, well, that's just me getting wrinkly. You're not worried because you know who you are and you know that people like you because you're you and it's got nothing to do with what you look like. Mm. It's the same with still with sex, for example. That, you know, you still like each other, even if we've both gone wrinkly. <laughs> We're the same people. And that's, that's uh, I think, that of all the things that I'd want to say about getting old, is that you're actually the same person that you always were. You just have got wrinkles now, and you, you know, you just change skin a few times, uh, a bit like a butterfly hatching out and the fresh one starting again. But it's still the same you. So whatever you were at six or 16 or 26 or 56, you're still that person. You just keep getting a new skin and you mature. Uh, and maturity is about understanding life and values um, in a way perhaps you didn't when you were young. You know, you were full of great keenness and enthusiasm and all sorts of lovely things. You still can have all that, but you've developed a long sight and you know things don't always work and you have to cope when they don't always work and you know how to cope. You know, you can cope. Um, you stop fretting in quite the same way about things as when you're young. It's less important to you. Um, not that it's unimportant. It just it doesn't fret you in the same way. And has that surprised you? Oh, yes. <laughs> and everybody said that how surprised they'd be. They all have, like I had, an internal picture of old age that they thought they were going to get to. Yeah, they thought they were going to get to. But when they got there, they found out that wasn't that. 
and it's it's fun and they're laughing and joking and enjoying life. Another thing that happens to you as well, which I didn't know about, I can remember I'm a keen walker, climb, I love the hills. And I remember taking my parents out in the car in Peak District National Park one day and thinking, oh, poor old souls, they'll never be able to go up those hills again. How do they feel looking at these hills and knowing they'll never be able to go up them again? It must be awful. And now I look at the hills, I think, oh, I went up that one. And that's nice. There's a nice style around there. And I know them and I can walk them in my head. And I look at an order survey map, but I just think about them. And I can do thousands of walks. And I don't miss them because I know I can't do them and I've accepted them. So it's just sort of an acceptance that happens about the bits you lose in life. But you haven't actually lost them because they're still there. It's rather an odd stage, really, but rather nice. I mean, one of the things that people talk about is life after retirement. And throughout this series, I've spoken to men and women who... Some of them actually initially felt quite a lot of fear about retirement. Mm. They felt like they might feel quite redundant as people um, and the the kind of fear about all this time that they would have. And I guess it obviously depends on their personal situation, whether they have a partner or whether they live alone. Um, For some of the men, they found it quite difficult in the sense that the work gave them their purpose and they felt quite purposeless when they didn't have work. Um, what's kind of been your experience from people that you've interacted with on your blog, your friends and your own family's experience of that? Yes, I, I think most people say they're busier now than they ever were in a happy kind of way. They just haven't time to do all the things that are offered in life, all the classes, all the people who want to go out and have lunch and the trips you might go on and you join clubs, you join societies, you take up new hobbies and you say, how did I ever have time to work? <laughs> And the part which a lot of people are actually working in the sense that they've got a lot of grandchildren duties, which are very nice, but it's still work. And they do volunteering and they do the church treasure or something. And life fills up without you knowing it, really. You, you look back and think, good heavens, where's the time gone? Mm. Yeah. The other thing that you you talk a lot about in your blog is about like the mindset of people as well, themselves as old people, older people. I mean, even I'm mm. kind of catching myself like, am I saying this right? It's one of the things that yeah. you're challenging about, you know, the mindset um, and challenging other people as well about this unthinking ageism, which you talk about. But the mindset mm. about actually, if we are more positive people, the chances are we will remain healthier for longer. We will live longer um, and prosper as well. How do you kind of give advice to say someone who perhaps doesn't have a partner, some of the people we've met as part of this series, actually, where, you know, they haven't got people that pop round or families that are close by. There's been a series of health complications where it just kind of, all of a sudden, you feel like you're a little bit out of your depth. Um, how do you yeah. kind of approach that positive mindset in, I guess, doing what you can when you can? Yes. I had a friend who was single. She had no children. Uh, and she didn't have any close family of any kind, no brothers, sisters or anybody. And she had an ashtray. And on that ashtray, it said, if you want a friend, be a friend. And she moved to a village where she knew no one. So she went and did everything that people needed doing in that village, like being the treasurer for the church. Nobody wanted to do that. She joined in everything and did the hard bits. And that got her a circle of friends. And when she had her 80th birthday in that village, 200 people came. Wow. You know, And I just think it's this ability to give out before you get back, that's important. You've got you've got to make an effort. So you think, well, maybe somebody would like a, a phone call from me, not waiting for them to call you, but you ring them, write a letter to somebody, offer to read to a kid, you know, do do something for somebody else, and just go out for a walk if you can. Health is a different issue, I have to say. But if you can get out and go for a walk, just go for a walk and smile at every tenth person. Do you know it's amazing how many people smile back, mm. or just greet everybody who's got a baby in a pram or pat every dog. And in no time, you've got conversations and you're talking to people. And if you do it regularly, you get to know people. Going out and making that contact effort is reaching out, I think, is what it's about. Another thing that I've found that people can do this positive is to start looking at what they do enjoy in life. Even if I'm on my own, what do I actually enjoy? 
Now, if I go for a walk on my own, I don't feel lonely because I'm always looking at plants or looking at birds or, and I almost talk to them, you know, because I'm interested in, oh, that's an interesting little place you've decided to grow, a little weed growing in a crack in a wall, you know. And I think it's that sort of befriending nature and befriending life. And if, for example, yesterday, I was just looking at a blue bottle on the balcony and it was just settled on the balcony. I thought, I haven't really looked at a blue bottle before. Normally you're swatting them away, aren't you? Mm. But there it was, lovely iridescent colours in the sun. And it stayed quite still and I could see its wings. They were quite lace-like. And I thought, I've never realised how beautiful a blue bottle is before. You know, and I think it's getting that little intensity or little enjoyment in life and just noting them as many as you can. Mm. Just keep noting them. Yeah. And you get a positive feel about life that way. I really, really kind of understand that mentality. One of the, the reasons that I was drawn to help work on this podcast series was uh, because in my 30s, I really, really struggled with loneliness, living on my own, um, mm. the weight of responsibility of keeping going on work, from debt, from yeah. study fees. Yeah. And um, it, it, it's very strange to even think about it, but I found myself recording this series, listening and hearing the stories of people like Audrey, who is 90, and we have had this thing in common that we kind of understood each other of what that was like and for me mm. walking was a great way there was a tree that I used to pass every day when I went on mm. this walk and I became kind of to know this tree in a different way I'd yeah. never noticed before I looked at this tree in different seasons and as I came yeah. through some of my darkest times I got to see how this tree and the seasons changed with me and my emotions and it's yeah. those small things I think what it you're is. kind of talking about it just make sure that in any one day there are five or six of those nice things it's refriending life really mm. and then you're part of it it's just a nice set of things to do <laughs> but the other thing you talk about is seeing older people as a resource I don't have uh, grandparents so I missed out on that kind of knowledge that some of you guys have talk to me about how can we people under 40 use you guys better to kind of help us when we get stuck oh we should do it shouldn't we we should have so many people tell me they've got a grandparent and how valuable their grandparent is but we should be grandparents to everybody so often talking to younger people they're struggling with boyfriends they're struggling with babies they're struggling with teenagers and you can tell them bits about your life how you dealt with it you're an ear that actually has been through it and understands it. I think that's the important. One of the, the resources we are is a listening, ought to be a listening ear that can reflect back on our own experiences to help them go through their experiences. I'll just tell them it doesn't matter, forget it. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I remember people saying to me when I got a teenage son in terrible trouble, someone said, you know, you'll find he's lovely when he's 22. <laughs> and they were right. <laughs> you know, at 16 or 17, I thought I should never have brought him into the world, you know. <laughs> 22 is lovely. It's lovely. It's right. Um, and there's so basic tips like how to budget and how to how we used to cope with life when it gets difficult because we had to, in the early years of our lives, a lot of us were very poor. So we know about coping with difficulties. And, you know, I think it's sometimes helpful to hear other people tell you how they managed it. But the other thing we've got, of course, is time. Um, and so the volunteering that is done by older people, I think there's a whole load of people contributing free time. And that's so important. What about the, if we kind of flip that the other way around, you know, the things that perhaps you've come to learn from like people who are younger than you as well, like the, you know, the title of your blog, Exploring the Modern World at 80 Years Old, and the fact that, you know, a few years ago you went on this course to kind of see what blogging was about. I spoke to Audrey a few episodes ago who at 89 discovered, actually, I can write and I can sketch. And she discovered this new talent in her late 80s. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, you know, how can we kind of make life a little bit more cyclical, really, that we come to you for help and you come to us for help so that there's kind of a closer intergenerational kind of working of society? Oh. Yes, I think that's right. I think, well, I think it's technology more than anything. As you get older and technology moves faster, 
you can't keep up with it. You you haven't got the background to keep up with. Whereas kids of seven are, are already speaking the language, aren't they? But to me, you know, a mouse still has a tail. <laughs> you know, you, you you haven't got the language, and it's very difficult at seventy and eighty to learn a new language. So you really not need someone to translate for you, to hold your hand. The blogging side of it was about the technical side and getting into a website and the words. What does it all mean, all this jargon? Uh, but the writing was fine because I, I'd already been writing for years. We all had, um, whereas we used to write letters and now you can write a blog. And even better, of course, you can publish it yourself. Whereas if you were writing letters to the editor, you had to wait and see if they would publish it or not. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's so much help in the modern world that older people need to k- keep up to date with the modern world in some way. That, I think, of all things this sort of swapping of what is life experience one way and the other is technical know-how the other way, I think. And then just their enthusiasms in life and let's see what they're interested in and what they're all doing and what they all do with their friends. They won't tell you everything because they never do. But, you know, just what's exciting them and why. And it's lovely to hear it from kids. Yeah, lovely The other more serious side of this is this word ageism. And Mm. how do you approach the word ageism? And what do you consider to be ageist? I think most people are not actually ageist in the sense that they despise old people or anything like that. But everybody has pictures of old age in their heads that they've grown over time, they've acquired attitudes. And, you know, you don't think you've acquired them, but they're all around you, these pictures in the media of wrinkly old hands and droopy old people and headlines about silver snarmies thing. And you get that picture in your head of old. And without realising it, it turns up every time the word old is mentioned. And so you are ageist in this, in that sense. People say, oh, you're looking young. And they don't realise what they've just said. Hang on. Young means good. Old means bad you know they've been they've internalized this idea of old being bad without really stopping to think what they were saying they're not deliberately saying to you well old is bad but you don't look old so i i don't see a lot of ageism as being deliberate i think a lot of it is sort of accidentally using that stereotype Mm. when they should be a bit thinking a lot harder about what they actually just said Mm. now there is ageism in the workplace where people are judged by they look old, or therefore they must be decrepit, they must be not as good. That is ageism. There are certain other things, what I call unthinking ageism, where people, because they've never been old, don't know what it's like to be old, and therefore can't imagine at all what it's like to be old. And so they design a lovely new lounge in a hotel, and all the chairs have got no arms and are about two foot off the floor. So nobody old can get out of them. Now, it's ageist because they should have thought about it, but they don't. What do you think about things like anti-aging cream? Do you laugh at this? Oh, I think there's a whole market for anti-ageist creams that is deliberately run by them. And they're the ones that imply old is a bad thing and wrinkles are bad things. Whereas, in fact, they're not at all. If you've lived a good life, you know, you'll get wrinkles and hope the laugh lines. But everybody will, so why worry? Yeah. It's the person that matters. One of the little sayings I've been wanting to say is, it's the twinkles that count, not the wrinkles. <laughs> it is. It is. It's who you are and what you are. Because none of us look beautiful most of the time. We look lovely when we're little kids and very often beautiful as young teenagers. And after that, we're all getting a bit decrepit. So we wake up looking rough and looks don't matter. It's it's who and what you are. that, And you know that, really. Mm. Uh, but you let these people sell you all these things that say you should look perfect. We let them do it. They're making money out of creating a fear of age. The phrase age is nothing but a number. You know, yeah. <laughs> the, whether people want to put a number on, right, when you get to this age, that means that you're old. And the, the thing that yeah. you often talk about is this, the happy curve, the life curve. Do you want to kind of yeah. give people an idea about, 
you know, the numbers yeah. that are around that and how that's changed as well. Oh, hasn't it just, isn't it lovely? You know, three or four years ago, the curve of human happiness was you start off quite happy when you're a child, of course, and then life gets harder towards your middle year and quite low in the middle years. That's the bit you're talking about when it's got more stressful ambition. You've got teenage kids yourself. And, uh, and a lot of people in their 40s and 50s, they see it just getting worse and worse because as far as they're concerned, it has got worse and worse. <laughs> but really, what happens somewhere around 60, it turns and starts uplifting until you get in the 70s. You get this bit there, gosh, it's nice to be 70, isn't it? We've got past all that, we've done all this. Well, you know, I'm enjoying it. I've still got my health because most of us have at 70. Uh, I've got all my hobbies, I've got my family, it's nice. <laughs> and so the peak of human happiness it was about 73, and it's going up all the time. So it's reaching 78, 79. And it's not even to do with health. So long as you're reasonably healthy, you're not in agony or you there's nothing really awful. We all put up with the bits of rust and bits of stiffness and getting out of breath occasionally because you just cope with that. But basically, it's a nice, happy period of life. Somewhere between 70 and 80 is great. <laughs> if you'd talk me through, you know, you don't have to go into personal details, but talk me through kind of your body now. How do you see it? Like, which bits are man-made and which bits are still your own and still going? Well, look at the other way around. If, when I was young, when I was five or six, if I had got what i got now, I would be in a real state because I had both got tracks done. I'm wearing hearing aids, all right? I've got rusty knees <laughs> and I've got high blood pressure. And I have a suspicion that I'd be virtually blind. I've just had a major operation this year, which I don't think anybody would have dreamed of doing on me uh, at my age, 83, 84 when I had it done. Major abdominal surgery at 84. You know, a few weeks later, I was climbing a hill in Wales. So the difference now is that we're just so much fitter. Mm. And the health service can do things that it could never do before. New hips, new knees, new everything. It's just amazing. And teeth, for example. I've got most of my own teeth or bits of my own teeth anyway. But my gen younger generation, everybody lost their teeth. Anybody from 30 on had false teeth. Mm. It's quite normal. Not now. So much is different. We're really quite fit compared to where we were. So this has also kind of led into you being quite active on Twitter. You've got your hashtag Age Proud campaign. Yeah. What's yeah. what's kind of been the reaction as you've kind of started blogging and doing your interviews and tweeting all about this? What are people saying to you? The people that I get involved with, like you, for example, yeah, they they all say, "Wow, that's great." So, but my family aren't particularly interested. <laughs> <laughs> I think quietly proud, maybe, but they don't say much. But for me personally, it's been amazing. I have a whole new career starting at eighty. It's just been totally unexpected, really. I was even offered a job a few weeks ago, <laughs> only part time to do some bit of PR stuff. But you know that that you can actually do that. Another old friend of mine, for example, she's a skier. She's still skiing at eighty, and she's had two new knees. She was a polar explorer in her youth, and they just made a film of her life. And there she is, eighty something or other touring the film festivals, showing this film of her life as a polar explorer. People just go on being super. If they have that sort of happiness and enthusiasm anyway, it stays with you, I think. Because like you, I had a very bad period in my 30s when I was divorced and had a, it was a single parent coping, homeless, and all sorts of stuff. And then again at 45, I lost my second husband uh, with cancer. So there's been rough bits. So you can't stay on top all the time. You know, I've had some serious downs. But I think getting older, you look back, you know you, you've coped. You've got tough somehow when you've got older. Mm. I, I think it's going to be harder from now on, I must admit. I'm in my 85th year now. I don't really expect it to get better. Uh, I expect I've got a lot of stuff, stuff to cope with coming up. For example, my husband's got Parkinson's. But I don't worry at all about dying. I've had my life. I've had a super life. If I die tomorrow, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, you know, I've done it. It's okay. In fact, I make a joke of it, really. I, I postpone a whole load of things I can postpone as long as possible, thinking I might never have to do it. <laughs> like, I don't, 
I do my tax at the very last minute thinking, well, you know, if I can make it to the end of the tax year, I won't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, you make a joke of it, the fact you, you might not be here. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. I can see how we are just part of a cycle. And I'm very lucky to have had my cycle. That's okay. So if you are if you were kind of maybe giving a bit of advice for someone who was looking at perhaps changing their perspective or, you know, they, they were stuck, they were kind of getting to that, they were starting to think, oh my goodness, I'm old and I'm not really sure what lies ahead of me. What would your advice be to someone about that? Get to meet old people, ask them about their lives, get them telling you that you've done it, get them telling you their stories and how they've coped with life. I just think, you know, listen to them. It makes all the difference once you get to know the real one. This is what my fault was about working in a hospital. I only saw the sad ones. Mind you, I did see, now I'm looking back, I realised once we got them better, then they would be laughing and joking and get their hair done, have the lipstick on, and great hopes had emerged from this sad little creature that had to come in. Because as a physiotherapist, our job was to rehabilitate them. And, and it was, watching them bloom again was lovely. But I hadn't realised that they were normal, that that was normal. I think there's a lot of invisibility about old age. People have this stereotype of what old age looks like. Grey hair, bent over, stick, and life's coming to an end of some kind. And when they see all these old people out, they don't really realise that, that they're living the same life as they're living. They're going to the same shops, going to the same supermarket, going to the same concerts, they're going to the same castles. You know, they're having part, family parties, they're having weddings. I mean, you know, they're living the same life as everybody else. They've got their hobbies, their friends, their interests. It's just that they look different and that makes them sort of weirdly invisible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You spoke at the Bright Life conference early this year. What was your experience of being there and hearing about the work that Bright Life have been kind of doing and uncovering and learning like themselves over the past few years? I thought it was superb. I I really loved the way they were connecting people up, the social prescribing side of it. But just what the important thing was, it was getting older people to do it themselves. It was facilitating older people, creating their own groups, doing their own thing, pulling together wasn't it? It was not doing it for them, just facilitating that they could do it, helping them to do it. And they can, they do. I think the biggest problem we all have has been transport, because if you can't get to things, then you are stuck. And I think one of the things that will transform the world, if we can get it right, is to get a lot more old people online using face-to-face contact online, Facebook, Skype, Zoom or whatever. That will make for a lot less loneliness. So if we can get these teenagers to teach older people how to use it and old people can tell them their stories, then they can all connect up with each other without having to go out. The transport will be a lot less. Mm, absolutely. I think that's really where we, we're on the way to going and I hope it all happens. Mm. Just talk me through a typical day for you, Joyce. You know, we're, we're, I'm hearing that you're saying how – Actually, on the street, when we walk past each other, our lives could be quite similar. I guess we've both yeah. got to wash our pants, do the washing Absolutely. up, yes. sweep yeah. up occasionally, a bit of hoovering. But like, what what is the life, a typical day of the life of, a, oh, of an 84-year-old? You have no idea how lazy I am. I, I, I love my bed. I have the softest possible bed and a big pile of pillows. And I'll get up quite early, maybe 7 o'clock, but I'll make a big pot of tea. And take it back to bed and I'll read the news, I'll read the tweets and then I'll do some writing in bed. <laughs> I very often don't emerge till well gone 10. It's lovely. And I'll do a few exercises, still in bed actually, so I do those, my stretches and turns and rolls. And I've had breakfast in bed, of course. <laughs> 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 so eventually I get up and usually go out somewhere. I play a lot of bridge, so I run a bridge group at my house uh, twice a week. So I have to be up for 10 o'clock for them coming on those two days. Other days we'll go off shopping or walk in a park or do something. And I le- like to make soup. So most days I spend a bit of time foraging in the fridge to see what all the leftovers are and what version of soup I can make out of the leftovers I've got there today. And then I go back to bed and have a nap. <laughs> 
But then I spend a lot of my time reading and out going for a walk, reading, using my iPad camera to take pictures of things that interest me so I can write blogs about them mm. when I'm walking. For example, I'll go, often go, I'm fairly new to living in Glasgow. So I got the map of Glasgow out and looked for all the green spaces around Glasgow. I thought I'll go and visit all of the green spaces. So I'll go for a walk in a different green space I've never seen before and then take photographs and find out a bit about its history on Google. But one of the more interesting ones I did was down the Clyde where I found an area where they were um, crushing cars. It was like a modern sculpture thing with all these weird bent shapes. I was taking photographs of them. But what was eerie was one side of the path that I was on was this noisy, crushing furnace. And on the other side to the left was quiet woodland with deer in it. You know, and I just love finding these these sorts of things. So I think my hobby is curiosity. Yeah. And you have yeah. the time to explore this. Yes. You wouldn't have seen the blue bottle because you'd be too that's busy right. thinking, I've got to do this, that and the other. Yes, that's right. I actually enjoy leisure time now. I really enjoy just looking stuff up for thinking about things even yeah it's lovely You've been listening to a conversation between Joyce Williams and me Claire Freeman on the Discover Bright Life podcast For more about Joyce and a sneak peek at her blog visit grandmawilliams.com And to read up on the lessons learnt and Bright Life Cheshire's legacy report on ways to overcome and tackle loneliness, visit brightlifecheshire.org.uk.